And we have a, we have a real weakness, I think, which was um, something which was mentioned again and again by um, the feistiest journalist I've ever known, Jonathan Mursky. I mean, he made feisty seem like such an understatement. I've never known anybody to storm out of as many dinner parties as, mm. as Jonathan because somebody had said something which he thought was outlandish or, or immoral. Um, he was a great journalist um, and wonderfully impossible. And he covered, he was the observer's man in uh, Be Beijing, in, in Beijing at the time. He was of in Tiananmen Square. He, he got Square. shingles Absolutely. as a result, yeah. He got, um, he was, he was helped to escape by the man who's now, I think, the chief executive of News International, Robert Thompson, mm. Mm. Um, with a broken arm or a, sh or a shattered arm and five teeth missing. But the, the thing that I think most reinforced his feelings about calling out wickedness, he's standing with a group of students um, uh, on the fringes of Tiananmen Square, and they all hear the sound of, of, of rifles, guns going off. And the kid sitting next to him says to him, don't worry, Grandpa, he says, um, uh, they're using plastic bullets, rubber bullets. At which point this kid drops dead at Mursky's feet with a red hole in his forehead. And Mursky always, always, always thought we should call out behavior which is wicked. And it's not some clever diplomatic um, example of, of, of real politic not mm. to do so. What, Pu what Putin is doing in Ukraine is wicked, and we should say so. What is happening in Xinjiang is wicked, and we should say so. What is happening in Hong Kong is almost as wicked, and we should say so. And I think one, is one thing which is true of all tyrants is they hate being put on the spot. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm entirely in favor of trying to find ways in which we can um, work with China, provided they stick to the rules. I'm not in favor of containing China, but Gerald Siegel, Siegel used to say we should constrain China mm. when it's behaving badly, and, and I, I, I think we should. Um, and uh, I think that means liberal democracies working together, um, standing up for one another, um, as we haven't many, many times in the past. But then you get, you know, then business intervenes. I remember the day after the national security law was imposed in Hong Kong, HSBC took out a full-page ad in the South China Morning Post congratulating the government of Beijing. I mean, okay, enough said yeah, about I, that. I, but but <laughs> there, there, is one, there is one thing to remember about, about a lot of companies, um, Western companies in, in Hong Kong. Um, the one people, the one group they don't think about are the people who work for them. Mm. The, the people who are running HSBC all have foreign passports. Yeah. You think any of you think many of their till clerks have, have have foreign passports? And every one of I think I'm right in saying that every one of my successors, as as it were, chief executive in Hong Kong, has either themselves or their mem or members of their family had foreign passports. Yeah. The, the present guy, the the police cop, the police guy. Um, his wife and two children have British passports. The last one, Carrie Lam, her husband and two sons have foreign passports. Now I'm not, I'm not against them. You know, good for them. It doesn't show terrific confidence in the future of, of Hong Kong <laughs> under communism. But, ne but nevertheless, uh, you know, good for them. They can, they can, they can see a good thing when it comes along. But it's, it's, it's one of the great paradoxes of history. Although the government is being good now by, about increasing. BNO passports in order that, that uh, younger people get them as, as well. But one of the paradoxes is that, is, that, is that people who have British passports or, or whose own kids have British passports have been persecuting kids who don't. And I think that's something that mm. should uh, bother us all. Do you think that this government here, and I know you're know, not a massive fan um, of it, and we might get onto that later, but this government here did the right thing by offering passports Absolutely, um, and it used to Should be... Should they have done it earlier? Probably, but um, it's interesting that when I was governor, it was a hugely big issue and a yeah. difficult issue. Uh, in the event, um, I don't think there has been... There's hardly been a single political tremor about it, which is, which is I think, a tribute to Hong Kong and Hong Kongers themselves, and a recognition both of 
their courage and bravery and what they stand for and of what they contribute mm. to society. I mean, in the last few weeks, two, two uh, stories which must be typical um, uh, for, for a lot of us with uh, over 100,000 Hong Kongers coming to live here and going to other countries as well. But the, I went back to my old school um, to give a prize to the sixth form and the new uh, chemistry teacher was just from Hong Kong with, had come mm. over with his family. Um, I'm in the street in, in Oxford a couple of weeks ago, and there's a there's a, a couple, middle-aged couple there with a with a son who's about 25, 26, I suppose. Um, he was he was there to be interviewed for a job with the medical um, mm. with the health authority in, in Oxford, a young doctor. Uh, we're hugely ben benefiting, and Hong Kong is 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 losing with the with these very talented people um, coming to or going to live in exile. They'd love to stay in Hong Kong, but they, mm -hmm. they can't see a decent future for themselves now. Just a quick one last one for me, and then we'll open it up. The, one of the whole points of One Country, Two Systems was to kind of make Hong Kong, or the Hong Kong arrangement, attractive to Taiwan. Obviously, if you're in Taiwan watching events in Hong Kong, you might be otherwise persuaded of yeah. the attractiveness of this opposition. How worried are you that Taiwan will become the real flashpoint between the West and China? Well, what's interesting <coughs> is, is that People who know China much better than me and people who know about the military balance much better than I do um, take that issue far more seriously than I've ever known in the past. I still find it difficult to believe that um, this Chinese communist leadership could be so foolish. But we um, know that he wants to do it. I mean, Xi Jinping is... Yeah, well, he, he, he spent years, he spent years looking over the water yeah. because the province he was working in was yeah. sort of opposite. Um, so it, probably the only thing he really knows about very much is, is, is Taiwan. But, you know, there's, what is it, is it 100 kilometers or miles of, of water between the mm. mainland and um, uh, there, is, there are very few um, beaches you can land on, yeah. there are mountains. And there is the example, there is the example of, of, uh, of um, uh, Ukraine. Um, Which must know, be putting them how, off. Yeah. We, know, we know how, how much they're, how much they have. Um, but, but, um, if everything else is lost, you can imagine circumstances in which a, a communist leadership would see an appeal to that grievance-soaked nationalism mm. being a way in which they could hold on to power. So when things go wrong, zero COVID, economic, you know, China will probably go into recession in the next quarter because of the zero COVID policy, you know, maybe another trade war with America, things going wrong uh, in, with their new best buddies in, in Russia. How likely is it, do you think, that some kind of military attempt on Taiwan will be used as a nationalist distraction from all the domestic woes? Well, um, it's uh, less improbable than it was. Right. But I still think that they must, they must surely be smart enough to know just how appallingly damaging it would be. It would wreck their economy, wreck their relationship with the rest of the world. I think it would be um, a, an act of the most supreme folly. Okay, questions from the audience. Okay, loads here. Lady in the front. Yeah. If there was one thing that you could change that you did, one thing you would have done differently, what would that be? I wouldn't have spent so long negotiating with China about the electoral arrangements. We went, in, in my diaries, the section on this is called Round and Round the Mulberry Bush. I mean, we were just being strung along. And it wasn't until we made clear that we were going to go ahead, that we had a bottom line and we were going to go ahead regardless, that, that, that we actually um, made any progress. So I think I, I listened too much to people who said, well, you've got to show that you're willing to go the extra mile, and we went the extra mm. mile, and then we went... And they've scrapped it anyway, an extra, haven't they? And then we went an extra mile, and they scrapped it anyway. Yeah. So I think that was probably um, an error. Uh, uh, um, something that I didn't do correctly but I didn't think I could do was to totally reform the housing situation in Hong Kong. Um, one of my, probably my most distinguished predecessor was Murray McLehose, who was governor, he didn't believe in democracy, but um, and indeed took exception when I went as a young backbencher to Hong Kong and then wrote a piece um, in The Guardian saying that, um, you know, Hong Kong should start with democracy and local government and Murray McLehose was having none of that. But he was, he was, um, he was, by instinct, um, a socialist in economic and social policy. 
And with the, with the huge increase of refugees coming in from mainland China, he began that huge public housing program. Mm. And I think it would have been better. I mean, he, he, he took half of what Singapore were doing as an example and didn't do the, cent the really clever bit that Singapore was doing, which was to relate um, housing and payment of rental to pensions. It, mm. was a, it was a brilliant thing. But by the time I was there with five years to go, um, people argued um, fairly convincingly, first of all, that if we took two radical steps on, on, on housing, um, it, it was in danger of completely screwing the, um, the market and the Hang Seng Index, which wouldn't have been very good. And secondly, it was pointed out to me, if there was one thing that people um, dislike more than prices for property going up, it was prices for property coming down. Mm. And uh, <laughs> so I wish I'd been able, I mean, if there hadn't been Not a Not just there, by the way. <laughs> no, I know, if there hadn't been a 1997, um, oh. I think that would have been a big priority. Okay. Gentleman here in the, with the glasses. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, how long do you think Hong Kong will finally become a true Chinese city, by which I mean they will block or censor internet access, and all Western news sites and social media are blocked, as in the mainland right now? Sorry, I didn't catch the first. How long will... How long do you reckon before Hong Kong becomes a true Chinese city? So now when you go into the mainland, Internet access is censored, Western social media okay. are blocked, so okay. on and so forth. Yeah. When one country, one system, yeah. Yeah. Although there's a joke, I think somebody, I was told about a joke in Hong Kong that they were now talking about one country, two systems. Yes. Um, uh, I think that um, it will be quite some time because there is in Hong Kong, um, I think it's the only place in China of which this is true, there is a real sense of citizenship. And there is the um, Cantonese language, which I guess um, Beijing will also try to stamp out. Um, and um, a real Cantonese culture and sense of humor um, and awareness of what it is and what it's been for, the, for not only people who live there, but for the rest of the world. One thing, one thing which Hong Kong has been, in a way, during these years of uh, communist rule in the rest of China, is China's memory palace. Mm. All sorts of things which are important for China as a whole have been possible because of Hong Kong. Publishing books, making films, and so on. Um, and I think that will endure. Uh, and it seems to me unlikely that the communist way of doing things is going to completely expunge, wipe out any of the uh, regional variations in, in the rest of China, or that it will survive um, against some of the consequences of technology and the consequences of people with an understanding of that there are better ways of, of running themselves. Another question. Gentleman in the front here. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm from Hong Kong. I thank you for the BNO scheme. <laughs> and I would like to know um, whether, um, because uh, Friday is the 20th, uh, 25th anniversary of, of the SAR, and what would you say to the Hong Kong people uh, who want to leave but, they, uh, but couldn't? And you're, you're filming this, right? So. <laughs> well, it, you're, it's, you're on air, Chris. Okay. It's, it's the most difficult question I get. Um, I'm regularly asked, um, for example, because of Oxford, I'm regularly asked by young Hong Kong students, and sometimes Chinese students, but Hong Kong students, whether they should go back to Hong Kong when they've got their <coughs> degrees. And it's a, it's a very difficult question for me to answer. And I'm not sure I always convince myself of the answer. And it's particularly difficult for me because um, I, I'm not required to be as brave as, as, as they may have to be. Um, I, th I, I always say that the ideas which Hong Kong represents are going to survive longer than, the, than what uh, Chinese communist, communism represents. I make that point. Um, and I talk about um, uh, 
the, um, in a sort of Nelson Mandela-ish way about, about those things. Um, and, uh, but I'm not sure, you know in politics when you can't really answer a question and you have to admit it. But the other day, I was, I was, some of you may know Richmond Park, and there's a wonderful place called the Isabella Plantation, mm. which in, um, you know, at certain times of the year is full of the most magnificent azaleas I've seen since I was in Hong Kong. And I was walking in it a, a year or so back with, my, with our latest Norfolk Terrier, and a group of uh, young Chinese um, came up to me. And one of them said to me, uh, do you recognize me? So I sort of faffed around for a bit. Um, gave, you know, tried to sound as though I did, but didn't. And he said, well, let me remind you, you um, I came to one of your speeches in, in, uh, in the union in Oxford when you were speaking to all the Chinese and Hong Kong students. And you had your photograph taken with, with me holding a yellow umbrella. And I said, oh, of course, I've had lots of photographs <laughs> taken. Uh, um, so he said, uh, look, he said, I'm, I'm finishing my PhD in Oxford. He was working on, I think, diabetes. And they were all medical students. And he said um, he was with his girlfriend, and his friend was with his girlfriend too. And he said, um, so when I finish, should I go back to Hong Kong? And I waffled away. And his girlfriend burst into tears. Uh, and that moved me quite a lot. Mm. Um, it is always the case in politics that when you can't really give a good answer to a question, um, something's going wrong. And I couldn't give a good answer to that question but I do strongly believe that the things that Hong Kong uh, citizens believe in and hold on to, I think those things are of enduring value. So glory to thee, Hong Kong. Give oil, right. <laughs> um, question in the front here. Thank you. Now you also mentioned Taiwan, and everybody in the world knows that the Taiwan right now is probably the next problem. Now, if and only if there's a war in Taiwan, how do you think it may affect Hong Kong? And how people in Hong Kong should prepare themselves for this? Well, if, if, if there was a war, if, the, um, if Beijing invaded Taiwan, it wouldn't just affect Hong Kong, it would affect uh, the whole world. It would be a disaster. It would be a disaster because it would clobber um, the Chinese economy, it would clobber the regional economy. There would be military, direct military consequences, I guess, for Hong Kong because it's so near the, near the it would be so near the war zone. But I repeat what I said earlier, whatever my criticisms of Xi Jinping, and they are considerable, um, I cannot believe that the Chinese Communist Party would be so stupid as to do that. I think it's still more likely that they will go on trying to undercut Taiwan's um, will to survive. And it's very important that we, go and go, we continue to try to help build up Taiwan's self-confidence. Um, I wish we'd done it earlier in uh, Ukraine, but we are doing it now. But um, for example, why don't we make a fuss about the fact that China stops um, Taiwan um, being part of the of the uh, uh, of the WHO mm. uh, conference, um, not necessarily being a full member, but being part of the of the annual conference? It's pathetic the way we allow ourselves to be pushed around in in that sort of way. Do you think that's going to change, by the way, Chris? Do you think as a result of China's flirtation with Russia, I hope know, so. Western spinelessness you know, on that so. particular issue? You know, yeah. Taiwan has handled COVID really rather well. Yeah, and, and, and it was partly Taiwan which first blew the whistle on mm. what was happening in Wuhan. Yeah. 
Um, and we know perfectly well that whether or not um, the disease center in Wuhan had, had anything to do with the coronavirus, nobody argues that the virus didn't start in China, in one of those wet markets, for example. Um, and nobody also argues other than that China broke the international health regulations by not reporting in yeah. a timely fashion what had actually happened um, with, that, with the beginning of that pan pandemic. And if we'd known and been able to work faster and earlier on the pandemic, a lot of lives and a lot of economies yeah. would have been saved. That, that, month, that one month of time lag yeah. basically cost millions of lives yeah. Yeah. around the world. Yeah, and there were those very, very brave Chinese doctors and mm. nurses, and particularly that very brave, that very brave dentist who tried to blow the whistle. And what happened to them? They were shut up by the, by the police and, and uh, threatened uh, that they, unless they kept quiet, um, they'd be put away. Another question? Yes, right at the back. Yep. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you for a fascinating talk. It's been wonderful to hear your views. And could I say, I hope a lot of those Hong Kong students who question you stay in the UK because we could benefit enormously from their input and their intellect and, and energy. I, I can't let you get away without having some comment on the Conservative Party. It feels so cheap by comparison, but come on, it's, it's half well, I was, past I was, eight. I was, you, I was slowly building up to that. an hour and 15 look, he's, minutes he's and just, you haven't mentioned desperate. it. Because he's, so, he's barely said anything about it. I think. So as a staunch Conservative who every day wakes up in despair at where we've got to, are you talking I mean, about him or you? I, 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 almost certainly both of us. Um, what does the future hold? <laughs> I said to Lavender this evening when I would come out, I just hope that this evening is going to be a Boris-free zone. <laughs> but, but there's no such thing. Never, never, there's, no, there's no such thing at the moment. Look, um, I am a conservative. Um, I don't believe in, in dogmatizing things. I'm profoundly skeptical. I believe in international cooperation. Um, I believe in, in competent government. I believe in institutions as being really important to the way a, a, an open democracy, an open society works. I don't believe that government should interfere with every institution, whether universities or local government, when it doesn't actually um, ag agree with some aspect of their policies. Um, I believe in trying to be as generous as we can be and trying to ensure that we live in a social market economy. I believe all those things and I also believe in doing what we can to keep the union together because I think we're better together than we would be separately. But the truth is that, um, uh, that as far as Nicola Sturgeon is, is concerned, visits by um, Boris to Scotland must be regarded by her as the gift that goes on giving, and it's it's um, it's, it's very worrying. Um, I, I hope that the Conservative Party will um, rediscover what it should be about. Um, I hope that it will be um, that it will understand that. Um, the worst thing, as I said to the, the Observer the other day, the worst thing is to be a populist party which isn't popular. Um, the, the, the worst thing is to um, judge everything by whether it, whether it solidifies support on the right wing of the Conservative Party for its leader. And it seems to me that uh, if you've got William Hague saying those sort of things and Michael Howard and others, um, then you should uh, take it very, very seriously. Um, I think that the condition of both our ma major parties has in the last 10 years been a reason why we're in such a mess today. Um, I think that it's, the fact that it's still so difficult for um, Labour MPs, even in these circumstances, to uh, be critical, critical of the behaviour by railway workers or others, although I think Lamy was starting to make some progress about um, airport workers the other day. I think that's, that's still a problem in the Labour Party, but the, the, the way in which Brexit has created a real schism in the Conservative Party, which continues to this day, is, is a serious issue. And we do need to be better governed because 
um, we're really facing some awful challenges with, with um, declining productivity rates, with a declining growth rate, and with lots of things we need to do, but we're not going to have the money to do in the future because we're not growing rapidly enough. So um, uh, I hope that Boris will at some stage decide to return to a career as um, writing books which will doubtless sell almost as many as the Hong Kong diaries. <laughs> How do you think the Chinese, you know, if you can channel what, you know, the, the many Chinese officials that you met over the years, how do you think they look at us at the moment? I should think um, as uh, an unnecessary uh, distraction. I don't think they think about us very much. I don't think anybody thinks But do you think that, much. I mean, do, do you think they think that we're going down a rabbit hole? Yeah, I, I think they probably... Um, I, I reckon they were probably very surprised by Brexit. Um, they used to actually believe that the European Union was a sort of pro political project which they could understand because um, it was a challenge to, um, to American uh, hegemony um, in their view. I think they must be surprised that we left. I think they still see the possibilities of making investments here in, in areas which can um, give them a foothold in particular sectors which are important for them, like nuclear mm. energy. Um, but I don't think, by and large, um, they take very much notice of, of what we do or what we say, except that we're a member of, of the Security Council in the UN, so they have to take a bit of notice of that, but not very much. Um, I think they probably reckon um, that they can get by by, at, th at the moment, thinking rather more about how to make make uh, create wedges in mm. Europe and how to deal with America than how to deal with us. Um, we started five minutes late. We've run five minutes over. Um, so we're going to wrap it up now. I just want to say, so I was in Hong Kong a lot in 2019 for the demonstrations, which were truly impressive be because of the scale, not so much the, the siege of the universities, but the actual scale of people coming out was magnificent. And that must have really scared the Chinese in Beijing because it was those big demos were very peaceful and very well organized. And although there was a police presence, it was hardly necessary. But I remember two things, which will, one of them will amuse you maybe. Um, the only other flag that was visible other than the Hong Kong flag was the Union Jack. And when you talk to these, some, some people even, even seeing hope and glory, the land of hope and glory. And you then talk to them and you say, well, what, what's this all about? Do you want to be a you know, British colony again? So no, 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 you don't understand. We don't want to go back to Britain. But the, the Brits, and you in particular, it's the last chap we remember who did something for us, stood up for us. And that's, that, that was quite, that moved me, and it must move you even more. And then the final one was, I was in the Polytechnic, which was a really quite a violent place for a couple of nights. I spent the night there with the students, and they'd fashioned all these crossbows and, you know, they were, it was like a sort of medieval reenactment of how they were fighting the, uh, the Hong Kong police. And it was, it was quite violent and they were shooting back with rubber bullets. And there was a young chap who was about to throw a Molotov cocktail and he had a balaclava on. And I interviewed him for Channel 4 News. And he said, is this going to be shown in Hong Kong? I said, I don't think so. It's going to be shown in Britain. He said, that's just as well as he was throwing the Molotov cocktail, because my mother thinks I'm having a sleepover with our, my best friend, and we're, and we're doing physics homework. <laughs> and that is, that sums it up. You know, the, all those kids doing homework in the first Umbrella Revolution, you know, yeah. in Occupy Hong Kong, for three months, double chemistry every afternoon before Molotov cocktails. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I just want to say thank you, Chris, thank you. for this wonderful book. Thank you for tonight.